Welcome back to the Good Morning Niger Show. We have our first guest on standby. He is going to talk to us about how businesses can adapt post-COVID. Yesterday, we looked at businesses and the SMEs and the struggle that COVID-19 has had on their businesses. Today, we're still going to expand further on the conversation because your business is very, very important to us. Today, we're going to be joined by Ayo Bankole, who is an expert in this regard. He's a strategy and transformation expert, and he's an SME coach. Good morning, Ayo Bankole, and thank you for joining us on the Good Morning Niger Show. The Ayo there. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Good Thank morning. You. Thank, Thank you, you for, for joining, joining us. us. It's good to be here. It's good to be here. So, uh, Mr. Ayo, let's so let's just go right into the conversation. We see that uh, you are uh, you are strategy expert and your transformation expert on SMEs and uh, related issues. So, we are in a situation. There's a pandemic. Where small scale businesses are struggling. This it's 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 a it's a major concern for um, entrepreneurs and business owners. What would you say is a way out of this? From your own point of view, your expertise point of view, what would you say can be the way forward, you know, post-COVID-19? Okay, so um, I, I think that the, the, the major way forward for SMEs really is to, is to, is to, is to adopt a digital transformation. Now, um, don't get it wrong. There are different levels of digitization. There is the level of digitization that is... Um, um, important for or that is adaptable for large enterprises, right? Mm -hmm. And there is digitization on the smaller scale that SMEs can leverage. Okay. And you know, it's very important that SMEs um, survive because mm -hmm. in Nigeria, you have, I mean, SMEs are very, MSMEs are very important to the Nigerian economy. They, they, they provide, they account for 96% of our businesses and 84% of employment in Nigeria. So if they don't survive, Nigeria economy dies, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very important that they begin to adopt how to take their businesses offline. So we're likely going to see an upscale of activities with logistics companies. Uh, we're likely going to see more application development um, or application web uh, uh, online enabled um, 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 businesses, SMEs. So for example, if you do your laundry real life, People have to come to your laundry store. It's best that you start, you know, uh, adopting technology to make orders, to make requests, to make deliveries. Now, another thing that is going to affect post-COVID is cash flow. How they are able to manage their cash at this point in time. And I've been sharing on social media that this is not the time to engage people to uh, develop uh, all sorts of services that you don't totally need. Uh, this is not the time to allow lockdown stop you from getting on businesses you have to deploy ways to take on businesses at this time and retain the cash so that you can have a buffer to fall back on post covid because after covid now the the the, the effects of covid is still going to last for about 12 months because even if covid itself stops today mm -hmm. there's going to be a period where there's going to be a a a a, a curve that people are going to spend to use to adjust to getting things back to normal. And then the economy itself will then begin to recover. And you know that economies recover on a quarterly basis. So SMEs have to ensure that their ability, their, their, their cash reserves at this point, you know, their spending is totally curtailed so that they will have sufficient buffer post-COVID. Aside that technology, I've said it, is very important. You have to leverage social media, you have to develop apps. And I'm not even talking about fancy apps that are not um, affordable for for small and medium businesses. I'm talking about easy to use applications and partnerships. You have to leverage partnerships. You need to develop partnership with tech uh, companies. If it's time for you to get uh, equity partners, fine, you can do it. If you can afford to pay off, you can do that. You need to partner with logistics companies so that you can make deliveries because a lot of people are still not going to be trust in face-to-face uh, uh, -face transactions for a long time. And if you don't quickly make uh, execute those partnerships, you're just going to you're just, you're going to want to struggle. Post okay, Ayo, let's speak about these partnerships you've talked about. What would you say are some of the best ways that companies can or businesses can decipher what partnerships to get into? Because we know that not all par partnerships are profitable. So how do you decide what partnership works for you and what is the best way to approach it? Okay, so uh, so the, the thing about partnerships is that you have to first document your strategic objectives and the various pillars that can, the strategic pillars or enablers that can help you achieve those objectives. 
So if, for example, I want to become uh, the number one in, um, say, uh, okay, let's get back to the example I used. I want to become the number one laundry supplier in maybe Lekki Axis, right? And I know that my capacity to produce is just 20,000 homes. Meanwhile, hypothetically speaking, I have 100,000 homes in Lekki. Now, what are my enablers? My enablers are first finance, right? I need to be able to um, uh, uh, ramp up my uh, ability, my capability from 20,000 to 100,000, right? That's objective one. Objective two is I need to be able to deliver to homes because your don't forget that your competitors are the big boys who are you know getting a lot of money on a monthly basis, right? Or have other alternative sources of of income. So I already have those two objectives, right? Get money, ramp up production. Let's say number three is be able to supply, right? Now I know that I, I can't get all the money I want at this point. So the first thing I do is. If I can't get all the money I want, meaning I can't own my own logistics uh, chain, right? Then I partner with a logistics company. Instead of paying that logistics company the cash that I don't have, I say, look, can we partner? You get X, Y, Z percentage on every delivery that you make for me. Uh, for finances, you can look for equity partners. So, for example, instead of owning your business alone, why not have uh, 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 equity partners. Mm. And, you know, that's one of the things about Nigerian businesses. You see a lot of sole proprietorships, right? But you see that globally, partnerships even tend to last longer because uh, uh, different people, you know, there's strength in diversity. You know, different people bring different skills on board. They bring mm. their resources on board. So that is the time for you to start considering those diversification, equity diversification, right? You also look at it again. Another thing that plays into partnership is values, right? What are your values, you know? Are those values are those values aligned? The values of the person you intend to partner with is it aligned with yours? Because if it is not aligned, then you're going to run into trouble. You're going to start fighting over little things. You are going to start having disagreements, and the business may just you know head for the rocks. So these are some of the these are some of the um, key factors to go into. Then how sustainable is the business? Is it or the individual that you are doing the business with? What's the person's reputation? What are the strengths of that person that the person is going to bring on board? You know, what are the weaknesses of that person that you have and you can complement? So you have to look at all those things if you are going to uh, strike partnership. But the primary thing is your objectives and your enablers and how the person can can, uh, uh, enable, can provide or support the realization of those enablers. Okay, um, Mr. Ayo, uh, a lot of uh, um, companies have been advised to go digital, right? We are advising most SMEs, yeah, make sure that you're going digital because that's the, 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 that will be the new playing field for businesses. Now, a lot of concerns regarding this whole online business with the common man in Nigeria is how do I trust that what you are offering online is what I would get? And the payment plan of pay before delivery has been a problem for businesses worldwide. And in Nigeria, it's even worse because people don't trust, if I pay this money into this account, would I get the product I'm, I'm paying for? So putting um, small businesses who have not really gained the trust of the people to say, okay, I'm online now and I need you to pay me before I deliver a product. How do you think this can actually work? Or how do you think is the best way to play around this situation? Okay, so, so there are two ways to it. And I agree with you totally. And I tell people who come to uh, Lagos SME Bootcamp that, you know, e-commerce businesses or online businesses as it is in Nigeria, you know, has major challenges. And that's why you've seen quite a number of, uh, you know, either failures or, acquis or acquisitions or, you know, exits. Uh, in that space, and it's largely because of the trust issue. You know, you know there's a trust deficit in Nigeria, mm -hmm. right? and then there's also the value system. So you are very correct. However, don't forget that we are talking about a post-COVID strategy, mm -hmm. and where number one, uh, the businesses are going to be supplying to existing customers using online platforms. So the trust okay. issue is minimal in this case because you are already you already have your customer base, and you are just. Uh, 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 now adopting a new channel of distribution. So there are two things here. But you are right. In terms of um, acquisition, new customer acquisition, that's where the trust issue comes in. And in that case, there's a lot of culture change that is not going on that didn't exist before, right? So 
more people are now relying on technology. People who either to did not have a lot of faith on in, in technology uh, platforms are now switching more. They are now adopting digital transformation and technology tied businesses and processes. So I, I don't foresee that the level of mistrust that existed would continue to exist at this point. However, you can't plan based on that best case scenario or okay. uh, uh, optimistic scenario. You still yes. have to plan for the worst case, which is the fact that people will not trust you yes. and people may not want to, uh, uh, people may not want to uh, patronize you via online platforms. So what that means is that you are going to be have to deploy certain uh, strategies, right? So, for example, you can uh, do a hundred percent or a subsidized cashback uh, uh, policy. Okay. Uh, you can do um, again. You can you have to push your physical store, uh, your physical store address in the faces of customers so that they see where you exist behind the door, behind your online platform. So that increases their trust level. You can't afford to just be, you know, 100% digital. And then don't forget that if there are six different types of SME businesses, you are not just a vendor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you use the example of um, online retail stores. Those guys don't manufacture, right? Yeah. They aggregate and then they buy and supply, right? So a lot of times what you're ordering for is not what you're getting. Mm -hmm. But in this case, there are quite a number of small businesses who manufacture. There are small businesses who sell. There are small businesses who uh, also um, trade, import, do all sorts of things, right? Now, it is important that whatever it is that you do, the process of the, uh, value delivery, you make your clients see that process. You can't afford to keep it vague. So mm -hmm. don't just assume that, oh, they should trust me, right? Put it out there on your platforms. Let people see where you're delivering from. Where pe let people know how you are how you are getting those items. Let people know how you are going to deliver it to them. If you have delivery partners, put it out there. Let people know as much transparency as you can. Please get it. Please put it out. And then you have to be committed to excellence, customer value and service excellence. That's just the culture that is different between Nigeria and uh, other countries who are getting e-commerce right. Where you, the level of dedication to excellence is very minimal. If you are committed to ex yes, if you are committed to excellence, then you will have very little trust issues. Then don't forget again that it, as bad as it is that we are low on infrastructure and commitment to excellence, we now do not have sufficient economies of scale. Mm. So, in, in, for example, if I order something from America, a big American store, yes, and I have an issue with it, they have sufficient, they have a large, they have economy, they have the benefit of economies of scale, so they can easily tell me to return, return and they send and me they another send one, another and they still one. be in a profit position. Yes, but you don't have that economies of scale, and you still do not have commitment to customer service excellence. So you are increasing the chances of a customer rejecting your 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 product. So it's double tragedy. So it, our Nigerians. And SME owners have to commit to customer services. Okay, let's talk about it. I'm really glad that you mentioned as, um, customer excellence and how excellence should be a big part of our culture because I'm very, very big on customer service. I'm very big to, um, it's very easy for me to call out bad customer service and also affirm good customer service. Now, the problem is also communication of values from the place of the business owner down to their um, their their employees. We find that sometimes you meet a certain employee of, uh, of, uh, of a business and the person is actually not dedicated, highly unprofessional, and you're wondering what is going on. Then you meet the owner of the business and it's a far cry from what you encountered. So how do employers, you know, business owners in this time communicate that value, that excellence that, is the, that they want to project as a hallmark of their business, how do they communicate it to their staff to ensure that same is communicated to the customers? Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And again, this, this question, very fantastic question, right? Because uh, it's one of the key areas that I'm passionate about. But this speaks more to medium businesses, right? Uh, you see that a lot of the micro and small businesses in most of those cases, you are the, you, the owners would interface with you at some point the because customer, the yes. size of their business is small, right? Now, there is a difference between uh, 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 personnel management and performance management, right? And a lot of organizations mix them up, right? So they are unable to tie 
the way they manage their personnel, which they believe is strictly HR function, to the realization of their strategic objectives. So the way you manage your personnel, their KPIs, their compensation versus, uh, 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 or their reward versus uh, 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 punishment or whatever structure, has to tie to corporate objectives. So if my objective is to be X, Y, Z, and I have identified the enablers to be one, customer satisfaction, two, customer uh, uh, um, uh, turnaround time in terms of delivery, X, Y, Z, then I begin to monitor all individual staff and ensure that whatever, I cascade that down and ensure that whatever happens to every customer, a staff down the chain is responsible, either good or bad. If a customer is satisfied, the staff has to see his own performance, his own reward, his own uh, growth in the organization. He has to be able to tie it to the satisfaction of every customer. And a lot of businesses get carried away once they start making good money and they have a lot of customers. They just believe, oh, it doesn't matter uh, if you go, somebody else will come. And that's how reputation begins to damage, right? And then there's this bad habit of automating, automating uh, customer service, right? Where you call and they just give you some mm -hmm. automated response. Automated response there's yes. no real, uh, uh, there's no uh, real concern yes. for the uh, 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 for the for the worries of the customer, because the the customer service person or the person delivering that service doesn't see himself. He does He can't connect how my salary is tied to this guy's happiness or, or how my reward, my promotion is tied to this guy's happiness. So those KPIs have to be set. They have to be deduced from your overall corporate objectives. You have to cascade it down, it has to be tied. Don't just develop some KPIs for the guy and just say, oh, uh, 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 the time you have to be punctual, mm -hmm. you have to be neat, you have to talk well on the phone, you have to, all those things are good to have, they are nice to have, but ask for KPIs that are tied to, you know, customer objectives. That's and this makes a lot of sense. <laughs> You know, it just reminds me of the carrot and the stick approach. How we're very, exactly. we should be very ready to compensate, to commend when good is done and be very ready to reprimand when we don't get the desired results, which leads me to my final question. At the start of this conversation, you have talked about how very important it is for businesses and business owners to not engage in online frivolities. That was not the exact word you used, but not engage in service, engage services that are not necessary. I'd like you to highlight some of these unnecessary services that business owners should not engage in this season and also highlight the services that are very important, you know, for them to engage in this season. Okay, I think what I mentioned, I didn't necessarily say online, I said this is not the time to um, procure items that you don't need, right? Okay. Okay, so so if you're familiar with um, accounting, right, you, you know that there is direct cost and there are indirect costs, right? Your direct cost of production or, you know, direct cost of your business are the costs that tie directly to producing what you what you what you make right now those are your costs those are the costs that should be close to your heart at this point in time right all the other indirect costs not can necessary. Be totally either they are not necessary except somehow they tie into your production right now I'll give you an example depending on you know I'm a strategy professional right and I explain to people that there is a difference between emergent strategy and a deliberate strategy. Now, for a small and micro business, you know, you don't need to put together a deliberate strategy. You don't need anybody to write a business plan for you. I've seen a lot of people online advertising, and they are quacks, advertising business plans for micro businesses. If you have not gotten to a point of scale where you are either trying to raise capital or your business, the money behind your investment is significant enough and you need an actual plan or you know, something like that. Why, why should you be documenting a business plan at this point in time, right? Whatever plan that you need to do, engage professionals like us. We can talk you through, you know, free way that you yourself can develop some of these plans. It's called a working plan. Then when your business stabilizes enough, you can then have a deliberate strategy. And as a matter of fact, aside, aside that, you need to be fluid enough at this point. You can't have a deliberate strategy that keeps you rigid. 
you need to be free enough to react to market forces. So things like consultancy, things like um, uh, 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 things like overload of, of personnel. I already said it, for example, if you are, for example, buying a bike at this point in time to make deliveries, I mean, that would be ridiculous. It's better to make, to, to execute partnerships with people whose core business is logistics, right? Uh, uh, so those kind of things are things that you need to critically avoid at this point in time, right? Services right. that do not directly tie to your, your production. Your production. Right. So basically just focusing on your needs as opposed to your wants. Thank yes. you so well, much. Thank you so much, Ayo Bankele, for joining us. It's been a very enlightening conversation. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but we look forward to having you again. We'll be speaking with Ayo Bankele on post-COVID strategy for SMEs. He is a strategy coach, and, and he's a strategy professional and an SME coach. And he's basically opened our eyes and just reminded us on some of the things that we need to know with regards to pushing our business forward in this time, most especially because it's a, a very sensitive time when we're fighting a pandemic, not just in Nigeria, but around the world.